1 Corinthians chapter 8, and let's look at verse number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So the title of the sermon this morning is coming there from verse number 8. Uh, sorry, verse number 9. Uh, sorry, where is it? Verse number 9. This liberty of yours. The title of the sermon this morning is This Liberty of Yours, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So what does it mean to have liberty? The Bible says that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have liberty. We have freedom in the Lord, don't we? And you guys might know John chapter 8, verse 12, which says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, the truth has made us free. We are free men in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ kept the laws of God perfectly. He kept the commandments of the Lord perfectly. So when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're born again, we have the new man, we have the new spirit, and we are not under the law. Okay? But not only the commandments of the Lord, but the Lord has given us so much freedom in this world to do things, and as we'll see in this chapter, according to our conscience. Did you know our conscience can tell us whether things are right or wrong? Not just the Word of God, but, the God, but God has given us a conscience. But here's what happens. We all have a conscience of man. We all have a conscience, but sometimes your conscience might be a little different to mine. Some of the things that I might do that's free in my conscience, in your conscience, are wrong. And for you, that would be wrong for you to do, but for me, it would be right for me to do those things. I'm not talking about the clear things that are listed in the Scriptures. I'm not talking about the things that are clearly sinful in the Scriptures. I'm talking about other things that we're free to participate, things that we have liberty to do in this world, but to other believers, it may very well be a sin because of their conscience. Okay, now look at, let's look at verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1. Before we get into all of that, there's a very important uh, key to this, this, to this chapter that we need to understand. It says, Now as touching things offered unto idols. What you'll notice is this chapter is primarily dealing with things that were offered unto idols, especially food that was offered unto idols, false gods, things that were sacrificed to false gods. So concerning these things, now one, one thing you need to understand in Australia, we're probably not that familiar with things being offered unto idols. Okay, because in many ways, you know, I, I kind of mock the, the fact that we're so-called a Christian nation. But in many ways, yes, Australia has been influenced by Christian values. Yes, it's been influenced by biblical truth. Okay, so we don't have, you know, the, the kind of the paganism. While we do have that in this nation, we don't have it to the same level that the Corinthians had in their church. Okay, where they worshipped multiple gods and people were offering things unto idols. And, you know, it was a challenge for the Christians to go into this city and teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ and get them to reject their false gods. But concerning the things that were offered unto idols, especially food, we know that we all have knowledge. Now let me pause there for a minute. According to the Bible, we all have knowledge. doesn't matter how long you've been saved. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for 20 years. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for two months. The Bible says we all have knowledge. What does that mean? That means none of us should be puffed up with the knowledge that we have because we all have knowledge. Even the babes in Christ have knowledge. And you'll notice here that it is referenced to being puffed up because it says we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. So the more knowledge you have, the more likely you could be to puff yourself up the more likely you could be to fill yourself with pride because of your knowledge. And you, maybe you know people, maybe you've been like this, and I know I've been like this, where I've gained new knowledge and a fellow brother has not had the same knowledge and I've felt pretty prideful. Hey, I know something you don't know and I've got to tell you my knowledge, right? And that's nothing wrong with having knowledge. It, there's nothing wrong with that, but notice the rest of it. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Charity. What is charity? Very, in a short summary, it's love, and we're going to go through this a little bit more. But when you have the knowledge, you need to make sure your knowledge is coupled together with charity. Because both knowledge builds up and charity builds up. Okay? Now here's the difference. Knowledge by itself builds you up. 
Knowledge by itself builds up your pride, but charity builds up other people. So when you go and teach people, when you teach them the knowledge that you have, you need to make sure you have the charity to go with it because that way you're ensuring that the person you're talking to, the person you're teaching, is being built up, is, being, is, is gaining, is, being profit, is profiting from the knowledge that you have. Otherwise, it's just you being prideful. Otherwise, it's just you putting people down because of how much knowledge you have versus how much knowledge they have. Okay, so charity builds up to other people. Now, why does the Bible use the word charity and not love? Like, a lot of the modern versions, by the way, have changed charity to love. But the King James Bible has retained the word charity. Because think of a charity. You know, when we say we, we've given to a charity, you might give money to a cause. You know, I remember, our brother, when we were having uh, breakfast together, I think, and, and a, a deaf man came along asking for money. You gave him some, some of your spare change. You gave to charity, right? What that is, is you've given, you've done something practical. You haven't just said, yes, I love you, but charity is doing something practical about that love, right? Because what's the point of me just saying I love you, but never showing that love? Never doing anything where I'm serving you out of love, okay? So when we talk about charities and giving to charities, it, the reason we give to charities is because they're doing something practical that's loving toward other people, right? Now, church is a charity as well, in a sense, right? Church is a charity. You give to church, why? For the purpose of us being able to go out and, you know, purchase the tracks, you know, being able to fellowship together, being able to get together so we can go out and preach the gospel to this lost and dying world. That is charity. We're doing something practical because we love the lost and we want to get them saved, right? And if you say to me, Kevin, I just don't have a love for the lost, well, let me, let me take you soul winning because when you go soul winning and you hear what people think they need to do to go to heaven, it'll give you a tear in your eye. It'll, it'll sadden you because you know this person's lost and going to hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. And I found that I loved people that were lost. Not, it's, it's not going so in. Sorry, I wasn't driven to go so winning because I loved people that were lost. When I went so winning, I developed that love for the lost because I started to hear their stories and I started to hear what they were trusting in to go to heaven. Verse number two. If any man think that he knoweth anything, and this is, by the way, this is knowing something without charity. Okay? So if any man thinks he knows anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. So without charity, yeah, you may have a lot of knowledge, but without the charity, the Bible says you really know nothing. Okay? It's not worth anything, because all you're doing is puffing yourself up and being full of pride. And let me just tell you, that's why church is so important. Okay? Why church is so important. It, it's one thing, right? And I, I know some of us have been in this situation where you, know, you listen to a lot of preaching online, but you've not had a church to go to. Okay, you, you learn a lot of things, you study the Bible, you hear a lot of preaching, you develop a lot, a lot of knowledge. But without a church where you can have people that you can show charity toward, you can end up being puffed up. You can end up being full of pride. Because it's, it's when you come to church and you still learn the Word of God, but you have other believers among you, you're going to have no choice but to love those people. At some point, you're going to develop a love. Even those that seem very different to you, even those that may have different standards to you, when you're gathered together in a church and you're fellowshipping with one another and you go out and you do the work together, it will naturally happen where you develop a love for the brethren. It will naturally develop where you want to edify the brethren. And so church is so important because, yes, you gain the knowledge, but you can also have the outward charity toward other people. Whereas if you skip church altogether and you say, well, I can just learn the Bible on my own, I can just listen to online preaching, I can just study, that will fill you with pride. And then when you meet another believer that doesn't have the same knowledge as you do, you're going to tear them down rather than build them up. Okay? Now, one thing I want you to notice, you guys, can, if you can, leave, leave your finger in 1 Corinthians 7. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 13. So just a few pages over. 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to take a lot of different things, uh, passages from different chapters. But while you're turning to 1 Corinthians 13, I just want to read to you John chapter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, And the Word, who was the Word? Jesus Christ. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Now, do you guys know the rest of that verse? Full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, 
but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we're talking about knowledge and charity. You could put it in another way. What is knowledge? Knowledge of the truth. And what is charity? Showing grace toward your brethren. When Jesus came, you know, when he left heaven and took on the form of a man, he came, yes, with truth. Yes, he came with knowledge. Yes, he came as a teacher. But he came with a lot of grace as well. A lot of grace toward sinners. A lot of grace toward the ignorant. Right? And his own sacrifice is full of grace for this lost world. Jesus knowing he came with grace and truth. We need to make sure we have the grace when we preach the truth. Okay? We need to make sure these two things are together because that's what Jesus had. And we're learning that as well here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Those things come together. And, you know, I was talking to my friend yesterday. Some of you guys, I mentioned to you, I had a friend yesterday. And we were talking about the IFB movement, you know, the IFB movement, the Independent Fundamental Baptist in Australia. And, you know, there's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of good doctrine. There's a lot of, you know, in-depth. There's, there's a lot of desire to know the Word of God. But there's no charity in many cases. There's not a lot of grace in many cases. And so as soon as someone is wrong in something, we cast them out of the church just because they're wrong. Rather than lovingly taking them aside and saying, look, brother, let me help you understand this. It's like, well, you're stupid if you don't understand that. Hey, you, don't, you need to take your brethren and have the charity, have the grace, so you can edify that person and train that person. Without it, you're just full of pride. Without it, you're full of pride. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you should be there, verse 4. What is charity? Let me just go through this very quickly. What is charity according to the Bible? And again, a lot of the modern versions will change this charity here to love. Okay? But charity suffereth long, so it's patient and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity is not, 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 not uh, seeking what other people have. Charity is what can I give to other people, right? Charity vaunteth not itself. What does vaunt mean? It means it does not boast. It's not puffed up. Okay? Uh, it says it there. And uh, not itself is not puffed up. So it's not prideful. Okay, those two kind of things. It doesn't boast. It's not prideful. Verse number five. Doth not behave itself unseemly. So it's of right behavior. It seeketh not her own. So if you're someone of charity, you don't look after just what can I get, but you seek after the needs of others. It is not easily provoked. We spoke about not being easily offended before. When you're easily offended, it's because you have a lack of charity. And it says, thinketh no evil. You know, so, you, you know, you say, well, this person's innocent till proven guilty. Right? And many times we think, well, that person's guilty until they prove themselves innocent. No, people ought to be innocent until they're proven guilty. Verse 6, rejoiceth not in iniquity. So, you know, if someone, if, if a believer does something wrong, they're caught in a sin, you know, we shouldn't rejoice over that. Well, you know, yeah, you know, that person deserves to be caught. And, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes we like to put down people because it makes us look good. We shouldn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So when we hear the Word of God, we hear the truth of the Word of God, we increase in knowledge, we, we rejoice in that truth. Not because we're trying to put people down, but because we're, we're understanding more of what God is, is telling us. Verse 7, It beareth all things. So someone that's charitable will carry the burdens of other people. They'll listen to the struggles other people are going through, the trials they're going through, and help them and encourage them. Believeth all things, hopeth all things. And I believe we can basically say that we give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, if they've done something wrong in the past, we give them the benefit of the doubt that now they're trying their best to work after the Lord. We believe what they're saying. We're hoping that they're trying to continue in the ways of the Lord endureth all things. So no matter what trial you go for, if you're someone that's full of charity, you're going to still shine through as someone and not give in to those trials, not, not fail at the point of that, those trials. And verse number eight, charity never faileth. What does that mean? Well, the context explains it. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So at some point, knowledge will go away. Tongue speaking, as far as biblical tongue speaking, that, that, that gift will, be, will cease. Um, prophecies, you know, new uh, revelations outside of the Word of God will fail. There's no more than what we already have in the Word of God. 
But regardless, all those attributes, all those qualities, all those gifts of God, the one that will continue forever is charity. And so it makes it the most important thing there. So we need to make sure again that we, yes, that we, we have a desire for the truth, we have a desire to grow in knowledge, but we also have a desire that we are charitable people. We are people that love and seek to edify your fellow brother in the Lord. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Okay, so what does this mean? So if someone loves God, you will know that they love God. Why? Because the context is charity. You have a charity toward other believers. And I'll just read to you quickly 1 John 4, 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So if you want to say, hey, how do I know brother Jason loves the Lord? How do I know brother Matthew loves the Lord? How do I know, you know, Pastor Kevin loves the Lord? How do we know these things? Well, do they love the brethren? Do they show charity toward? Are they considerate toward the brethren in the church? That's how we know. Because if, if, we, if someone's in here and they don't want to fellowship with their brothers and sisters, they don't care about you know, uh, doing, serving one another, anything like that, then we know they don't love God. They're alive if they say they love God. So we know people love God if they love the brethren. Now verse number 4. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 4. Now we're going back onto the idol thing. Understanding that, that's important. Understanding that the need to love our brethren is important. But verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. So people offer things to idols. Should we really be concerned that people are doing that? Well, not really, because we know an idol is nothing. We know an idol has no power. And I've preached on idolatry not long ago. We understand that the, the idol in of itself has no power. Okay? It can't do any harm to you. It's nothing. But what we have is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have the God of the Bible. We have the one true God which we serve. This church is a church of that one true God. We have, the, the, uh, it says there at the end of verse 4, and that there is none other God but one. How many gods are there? One God, right? And that's our God. It's the God of the Bible. These other gods, these idols, these false gods, are not true gods, okay? They are nothing in of themselves. Verse 5. For though there be, sorry, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. So on this earth, yes, there are many gods. Yes, on this earth there are many lords. But again, none of those are the one true God. Okay? Verse 6. But to us, okay, there is but one God. This is the memory verse. But to us, there is but one God. Now let's, let's understand this because <laughs> here's where people can get confused. If we re let's, read it, let's read it the confusing way. Okay, There is but one God, the Father. So, ah, the Father is the one God of whom are all things and we in Him and one Lord Jesus Christ. Well, hold on. I thought there was only one God, the Father. But then who's this? The Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Is it saying here that there is only one God who is the Father? Is that what it's saying? No. Because we know Jesus Christ is God as well. Right? So this is how it should be read. But to us, there is one God, comma. Who is this one God? The Father... Okay, of whom are all things and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. So the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is the one God. This is teaching the Trinity. Of course, it doesn't mention the Holy Spirit here, but we know the Father is God, and we know the Lord Jesus Christ is God. Okay? But notice what it says about the Lord Jesus Christ. How many Lord Jesus Christ are there? Do you notice what it says? One Lord Jesus Christ. And look, I, I wouldn't spend time on this verse because this verse is, is, should be basic doctrine. It's a core doctrine. We've already preached on the, on the Trinity. But as you guys know, I feel like I'm being dragged into this Trinity controversy, into this Trinity debate. And I feel like I just need to make the things clear 
There's one Lord Jesus Christ. One. So if Jesus is the Son of God and that's who he is, can we say that the Father is Jesus Christ? Or is that two Jesus Christs? Can we say the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ? Or is that three Jesus Christs? How many Jesus Christs are there? How many Jesus are there? There's one Lord Jesus Christ. And you're thinking, Kevin, we know that. I know that. I don't understand why this is confusing for some people. Right? The Father is not Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus Christ. And let's just understand this further from this verse because this verse has a lot to, to, to uh, teach us. Back to the Father. The, the, God the Father. So there is but one God the Father of whom are all things. So everything in the universe, everything that's, that exists, okay, is the fact that all, all things, basically it's saying here, all things consist because of the Father. Everything in this world belongs to the Father. Okay? But no, notice what it says about Jesus. The one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things. So everything in this universe exists because of Jesus. Okay? So everything consists because of the Father, because he owns all things, but everything exists because of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the creator. He is the one that created all things. But all those things belong to the Father. And as, as if you, you know, we, we, we learnt about the end times, we know at the end of the millennium, yes, everything is subdued under Christ, but then Christ hands that kingdom over to the Father because ultimately everything belongs to the Father, but everything the Father does is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now notice the, the, other, the other bit of it says, of whom are all things, we're talking about the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him. So if you're a believer, you are in the Father. Okay? The, and we, we read about how, you know, well, when we're talking about eternal security, that we are in the Father's hand as well. We are in Him. We're secured by Him. But how do we go in Him when it says, and the one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him? So how do we go, how do we, how, how are we in the Father? By Him, by Jesus. It's through Jesus that we go into the Father. We're eternally secure in the Father because we go by Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ that we go to the Father. Basic doctrine, okay? You guys know this. You know, my kids know this. So let me say this to you. This verse is saying, in order to be in the Father, in order to be of the Father, we need to go by Jesus Christ, right? By the one, by the one, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Let me reinforce that. Can we get to the Father without Jesus Christ? No, we need Jesus Christ to get to the Father. But think about this. And this is the controversy that's going on. And, and you know, I've told you guys, I draw the line where, where you start calling, where you start giving the personal name of the Father of Jesus and you give the personal name of the Holy Spirit as Jesus. Because if Jesus, if the Father is Jesus, okay, and we know that we need to go to the Father through Jesus, and the Father's already Jesus, then why can't we just go to the Father directly? He's Jesus. So what's the point of the Son? If the Father is Jesus, and we need to go through Jesus to get to the Father, then we can just go straight to the Father. We don't need the Son. Does that make sense? It destroys the basic principle throughout the whole Scriptures that the only way to the Father is through Christ, is through Jesus Christ. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me, said Jesus Christ. I'll just read to you 1 John 2.22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So in order to have the Father, we must go through the Son. What is the Son's name? Jesus, the one Lord Jesus Christ. Not the Father. The Father is not Jesus Christ. We cannot go to the Father through the Father. We cannot go through the Father through the Holy Spirit. 
We go through the Father, to the Father through Jesus Christ, and when you believe in Christ, you're given the Spirit of God, and you are made known to the Father, and you are saved. Okay? If you start giving the name of the Father as Jesus, yes, I know you're trying to, to exalt Jesus. You know, you think you're trying to exalt Jesus, but then what you're actually doing is saying, well, we don't need the Son. Now, I know people aren't saying that, but that's the logical step. Why do we need the Son if the Father's already Jesus? In fact, you're undermining who Jesus Christ is. And that's one of the major problems of this oneness doctrine where everyone's Jesus. No, there's one Lord Jesus Christ. It just starts opening a can of worms. It starts destroying, destroying just very foundational truths that everybody already knows that the Scriptures clearly state when you start mucking around with the Godhead, when you start mucking around with the Trinity. Okay, I didn't want to spend my time on that, but I feel like I had to cover that. Verse number 7, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. So not every man has the knowledge that there's one God, because many men think there's many gods, false idols and all that stuff. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. Now that, that phrase is very important to the rest of it. So those that, according to their conscience, if they eat something that's offered, that, that, that's been um, offered to an idol, um, uh, sorry, when they eat something that's been offered to an idol, they recognize that this is a religious practice, that they're eating something that, that was offered to an idol, and their conscience says, hey, this is a religious thing that I've done, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So because their conscience is weak, because they don't have the knowledge of one God and they think this idol is some sort of false God and some sort of true God, when they eat of that idol, they are defiling themselves. They're committing a sin because they're partaking of a sinful religious uh, act, but in their conscience, okay? Not in our conscience because we know there's one God and if we eat something that was offered to an idol, it's just food. It doesn't matter. It belongs to the Lord, right? But to someone that believes there are a false gods, they can eat of it, and that defiles their conscience because they think that is a true God that it's being offered to. Now, verse number 8. But meat commendeth us not to God. So he's saying, look, no matter what you eat, whether it's something that's offered to an idol or not offered to an idol, or whether, you know, you, you, know, you try to eat organic foods, or if you, you know, you're, you're a vegetarian and you think that's more, you know, more right or whatever, look, it doesn't matter what you eat, it doesn't make you any more right to God. You know, it doesn't commend us to God. It doesn't matter what you eat. You can eat McDonald's or you can eat, you know, a good steak or whatever. You don't earn any spiritual points with God in what you eat. And I think about the Old Testament dietary laws, you know, how certain foods were restricted. And I actually think there's a lot of profit in following the Old... And now, I don't follow the Old Testament dietary laws, but I think there's a lot of profit. I think there's a lot of health benefits if you did. Okay, because at the end of the day, that was God's knowledge that gave to the Old Testament Israel, and obviously God's wisdom is far above our wisdom. I think there's a lot of health benefits if you ate the Old Testament dietary laws, though that's not put upon us. But if you did that, yes, you might improve your health, but you're not going to improve your place, your spiritual place before God. Okay, because it doesn't matter what you eat. Okay, for neither if we eat are we the better? So we're not better if we eat certain things. Neither if we eat not are we the worse. It makes no difference. Now, <clears throat> uh, please turn, keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 8. Please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because I, I, I want to drive something home here and I think we don't do it very well in this church. Something that we can improve in this church. Okay? And I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not so prideful to say that there aren't things that in this church we can improve. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Understanding things concerning, you know, things that were offered unto idols and all that stuff, foods. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry, and now notice the next bit, this is the bit that I want you to focus on, and commanding to abstain from meats. Okay, so there were people saying, hey, you can't eat certain foods. Okay, I think of vegetarian, I think of vegans that say, hey, you can't eat certain meats. But then you might have a weak brother who's weak in the conscience and says, well, that food was offered to an idol, you shouldn't eat of it. Okay, commanded to abstain from meats, which God hath created, notice the next few words, to be received with thanksgiving to them which believe and know the truth. 
So when we partake of eating food, we don't know, like I've bought, I bought bread and ham and stuff, we don't know necessarily, hey, who knows? While that was being prepared and being made, who knows? That may have been offered to an idol. Who knows, right? I, I don't care because I know there's one true God and I know an idol is nothing. But it says, hey, when we take food, we need to receive it with thanksgiving, okay? So what I'm trying to say to you is, and I know, I know we do this sometimes, but many times we don't, when we get together and we have lunch together, when we have a meal together, Please don't dig into the food immediately. Let's stop and give thanks to God for the food, okay? We're meant to receive what we eat with thanksgiving. That's something we can improve as, as a church. Verse number four, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. You can eat any creature. Does that include snake and, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't eat that kind of stuff, but I guess every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So again, Please, let's get into a habit when we eat together as a church that we give thanks to the God, we receive the food with thanksgiving because it's, it's the Lord's, okay? Same thing for you at home. Good practice to get into before you eat. Give thanks for the food that the Lord has provided. So that, that is something that we can improve as a church. So let's do that moving forward. Let's make sure that we don't partake of eating until we give thanks for the food together. Verse number nine. Oh, sorry. Back to First, uh, yeah, back to First Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But take heed. So listen, take heed, listen to this. Lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So you are free to eat food that's been sacrificed to idols. That's your liberty. But take heed, listen, pay attention. Because you don't want your liberty to become a stumbling block to those that are weak. Because there, are, there may be other people, unsaved, even people in the church, that if they think we're eating food that's been offered to idols, they're going to defile their conscience because they think that idol meat has some sort of religious significance, that they've done some, some sort of you know, um, uh, you know, evil religious act, and that's going to defile the conscience. You shouldn't be so puffed up with knowledge that you don't consider the brethren that are weaker in conscience. Okay, And we'll see this play out for the rest of the, the, the chapter. But verse number 10, If any man see thee which has knowledge, seat at meat in the idol's temple. Now, I don't know why a believer would be in an idol's temple eating food. I, I don't know why. But this is just uh, hypothetical. Okay, It's a hypothetical thing. For if any man, if a man see thee, sees a believer which has knowledge, because you know, if I go and eat at an idol's temple, I'm just eating food. I know that idol is nothing. I know that temple is nothing. It's just food. I can eat it. I have the liberty to eat it. Now, I don't, again, I don't know why you do that. But you could. Okay, that's your liberty. You could do that. Okay? Now, but if a man sees you do that, shall not the conscience of him, the man that sees you, which is weak, be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Right? Because they're weak, because they think this is a religious activity that's taking place, they might see you as a believer using your liberty, eating th things that were offered to an idol, and say, well, wow, if a Christian can do that, and that's my brother in Christ, or that's a mature believer, then I can participate in this, thinking that we're participating of some religious activity with a false idol. So their conscience then is defiled because they, in their minds, in their conscience, they're serving a false god. They're sacrificing to a false god. And verse 11, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Okay, for whom Christ died. So now it's a believer. If a believer, you know, if, if, if they see you go into a, a, a temple, a false religious temple, and they see you do that, they're going to think, it's going to destroy them, right? It's going to go, well, how does that make sense? You know, is it okay for a Christian then to participate in religious activities of false gods? Well, the question then gets brought up is this. So Kevin, is it right or wrong to eat food which were offered to idols. It seems kind of contradictive. Can we eat? It's saying we have the liberty. Can we do that? But then it's kind of saying, well, it's wrong to... Of course, we wouldn't expect a believer to be in a temple eating food that was offered to an idol. Uh, please turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And again, keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 8. But Revelation chapter 2, I want to show you a couple of things. Because is it wrong to eat food that's sacrificed to idols, first of all? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> The answer is yes and no. And again, it comes down to your conscience. Okay. But Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, 
These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. So this church is doing well, but then he says, I've got a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So should this church be eating things sacrificed unto idols? No. God saying that, I have these things against you. You're eating things that are sacrificed unto idols. Look at verse 18. Revelation 2.18. So this is another church. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who have his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity. So they've got the charity. And service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast suffered the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So both these churches, Pergamos and Thyatira, God is saying, I have a few things against you because you're eating things sacrificed unto idols. Isabel, do me a favor. Can you close those sliding doors? Just the, the three of them so it doesn't make too much noise. Now, so is it wrong to eat things that are sacrificed to idols? Yes! Jesus is saying, I have these things against this church for doing so. But in what way is it wrong to eat things sacrificed unto idols? It's knowing, it, it, it's, uh, it's teaching or, or being part of a religious activity where that idol is being served. Isabel, all three? Where that, that idol is being served, where that idol, that things are being sacrificed unto the idol and you're making the conscience of your weak brother defiled. That's where it's wrong, Okay. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There's a lot in this chapter that we can take to help understand this because it seems like a contradiction, but I believe the answer can be found here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. Because look what it says about Old Testament Israel. Verse, verse 18. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. So when, in the Old Testament days, when they were sacrificing, uh, you know, the sheep and the oxen or whatever, and you partook of that, you ate of that sacrifice, it's saying you're partaking of the altar. This is a religious act. This is a relig religious worship toward God that you're partaking of, okay? So that's true in the Old Testament days. When they sacrificed food unto God and they partook of that, they ate of it, this was a religious practice unto God. Look at verse 19. What say I then, that an idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? So again, it's not anything. But I say that the things with the, which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that you should fellowship with devils. So we shouldn't partake of food sacrificed to idols, because in the Old Testament days there was a religious activity you know, uh, doing that to, toward God in the same way when they sacrifice to devils, we are not to partake of that fellowship with the devils, okay? And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. If you eat things that were sacrificed to idols, you are, in a sense, fellowshipping with devils. Verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You either serve the Lord or you serve devils. It can't be one and it can't be both together. You know, and we as believers ought to be serving the Lord. Verse 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We serve a jealous God. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Remember, why was God a jealous God? Because he says, hey, we ought to not worship or serve other gods besides him. And so what draws God to jealousy is when we believers serve other gods, when we serve other, when God's people in the Old Testament or the New Testament serve false gods that are not the one true God. But look at verse 23. All things are lawful for me. So I can eat of the food that was sacrificed to God. All things are lawful unto me. Why? Because we have liberty. Okay? 
But all things are not expedient. Not all things are profitable. Not all things that I do are going to edify my brethren. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Okay, so if I go and... and If I go and eat, you know, of things offered unto idols, then, you know, that's not profitable to my brethren. That's not going to edify my brethren. That could cause them to defile their conscience. Verse 24, Let no man seek his own, but every man's another's wealth. So we're to consider the wealth of other believers. We need to consider their conscience. We need to consider their edification. And if we're eating things that are offered unto idols and that's pulling them down and confusing them, we ought to not participate of that food, okay? Verse 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. What's things that are sold in the shambles? That's things that are sold in the marketplace. Things that are sold in the shops. Now, there might be things that you buy from the shops that were sacrificed unto idols. Think of halal certification. You know, in Australia, if you go to a butcher, most butchers in Sydney, sorry, not Australia, in Sydney, most butchers in Sydney have the halal approved symbol. I haven't seen that really here. But in Sydney, there are a lot of Muslims, all right? And for the butchers to make maximum profit, they want to be able to sell to, to, to people that are of the Islamic faith. So they get the, the halal certification. And look, what halal means, it means permissible. It means that this, the way this animal sac was sacrificed, the way this animal died, the way this animal was being served is permissible to the Islamic faith. And so Muslims can eat of that meat. That's what it means. But also, when it becomes permissible, a sheikh prays, prays over it and sort of offers it to Allah. And they say, well, you know, this is permissible in accordance to Allah. They do their prayer. And in a sense, someone of a weak conscience might say, well, then I don't want to partake of that food that's been certified halal. Because it's been prayed to a false god. It's been prayed to. It's been offered to Allah. But again, we have the liberty to know, hey, the idol's nothing. That's a false god. It has no power. I have the liberty to participate of those things. So things that you buy from the shambles, things that you buy at the store, yeah, you don't know. They may very well have been offered to idols. But it says in verse 25, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So if you buy something, just eat it because you have the liberty to eat it. Don't ask. Don't find out, was this offered? You know, what about this product? What about this product? What gods were this offered? Don't, for conscience sake. Don't defile your conscience. You know, just, just eat of it. Don't ask questions. Just eat of it. Verse 26, why? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast. So if unbelieving family invites you to their house to have a feast, to eat together. It says, and ye be disposed to go. You know, you say, yeah, I want to go. Whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Just eat of it. If somebody invites you to eat, just eat. Don't ask him, hey, did you offer this to an idol? Just eat it. Save your conscience from being defiled. You know, because you have the liberty. You're, you've got the freedom to eat things that may or may not have been offered to idols. Okay? And I kind of think about a situation where I went soul winning once and I knocked on the door of a, of a Muslim man and I tried to give him the gospel, but he was busy. He was doing a barbecue. He was doing barbecue chicken. And if he's Islamic, yeah, probably it's halal certified, whatever. And then he's like, oh, before you go, he came and brought some chicken to me, barbecue chicken. Before you go, you know, you can have something to eat because it was around lunchtime that we were going soul winning. So he offered me food. I didn't ask for conscience sake, I just ate it. <laughs> I, I, I know that the God that he may have offered it to is a false God. I just ate it. Who cares? You know, I was hungry, it was lunchtime, you know, gave me the gave me the fuel to keep going and you know preach the gospel some more. Eat it, who cares? You know? Don't ask. But notice what it says here in verse 28. But if any man say unto you, so again, remembering, someone invites you to a feast, you come together, you're about to eat of the food. And you haven't asked questions, but a man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols. You know how when we, when before we eat, we give thanks, and we give thanks for the, to God for the food? Similar, but they do the same thing to an idol. Hey, you know, we're, we're participating of this meal together. It's offered to this false God. You know, we're serving, we're giving thanks to this false God. It says, eat not for his sake that showed it. 
So the person that says, hey, this is an offering to a false god, don't eat of it for their sake and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So verse 29 says this, conscience, what, what, what does he mean by conscience sake? Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So if a non-believer invites you, let's say Islamic man, a Muslim family that many of them are very friendly, invites you over to eat, you say, all right, let's go eat. Maybe you'll get the chance to preach the gospel to them. You sit down to eat and they say, hey, this meal has been provided to us by Allah. Let's give him thanks. Let's praise him. Then you know what? Me as a believer, I'm going to refuse that meal and say, no, I serve the Lord God of the Bible. I do not serve Allah. I'm not going to participate. Not because if I ate it, I'm doing anything wrong. But because for your conscience, I want you to know that as a believer, I do not worship false gods. I'm not going to fellowship with false idols. Okay? And that is where it gets wrong. Because if you participate of that meal, knowing that it was sacrificed to idol, and you're defiling the conscience of other people, that's when you ought not to eat food that's sacrificed to idols. And so these churches in Revelation that were doing wrong, eating things that were offered unto idols, it was because in that church... There were certain people saying, hey, yes, let's give thanks to these false gods for this food and they'll defile in the conscience of their brethren. That's when it's wrong. It's according to your conscience and according to the conscience of other people. But again, food in and of itself, you know, yeah. you know, some Buddhists, for example, they might have a Buddha statue. I don't know if you've seen this. I see this a lot in Sydney. And then they give them, like, to the statue, they put, like, oranges. It's like, well, we're offering these oranges to Buddha or whatever. But then, obviously, the, the idol's not going to eat them. So, like, for example, I, I, can, think of, I can think of a uh, fruit market that's owned by a Buddhist family. And you see, a, like, a Buddhist statue, and then you see oranges. With the, with, it, doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me if after a while they take those oranges off that, that statue and just put it amongst the other oranges. So I might just come along, buy oranges, take oranges that were offered to the idol. Okay, and I just, I, it's just an orange. <laughs> it's just an orange. I can eat of it, right? But if, if, if as I'm purchasing them and the guy says, yeah, you know, let's, let's thank Buddha or whatever for this food, you know, this food that's been offered to Buddha, then I'm not going to eat of it because it's going to defile the conscience of the one that's telling me that that's, that's a false believer, that, sorry, that has a false religion and also, it also may defile the conscience of fellow believers. So why is, why is Kevin eating of those oranges knowing full well they were offered unto idols? Does that make sense? Does that make sense when it's right to eat Food that's been offered it's always right you have the liberty to eat you know if you're a strong christian if you if your conscience has not been defiled you can eat food that was offered unto idols there may be many food products you purchase from the store that may have been halal approved or whatever you don't know offered somewhere to another god you just eat it you just take it you just eat it because it's the lord's okay everything belongs to the lord and so it's fine to eat of it but if you're participating of a religious event that could cause the conscience of other people to be defiled, then you should not eat of it. That's when it's wrong, because you need to consider the conscience of other people. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Verse number 12. Oh, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. I'm almost done here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. But when you sin, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So again, if I'm participating of that food sacrifice to idols, it's not wrong in of itself. But if you defile the conscience, you hurt the weak brethren, then you're actually sinning. And you don't just sin against them, but you sin against Christ. You sin against Jesus Christ. Now, let's take an, let's take an application here. I'm not just talking about food offered unto idols. Think about certain things that you may do that can defile the conscience of a weaker believer. You know, and, and I'm kind of thinking about things like social media and Facebook. And one thing that really disturbs me is when I see pastors on Facebook promote Hollywood movies or promote that they're going to a cinema to watch this movie. Now look, I'm not saying every movie is sinful or wrong. Maybe the look, I'd be surprised if there is really a good movie out there without anything that, defi you know, that, that, you know, that doesn't blaspheme God or something. I'd be surprised. But let's say there is, hypothetically. 
and you go on Facebook and you promote, hey, I'm going to go watch this movie, what's going to happen to the week of believers? Those that know full well, hey, Hollywood and the movies at the cinemas are full of filth, full of, you know, uh, nudity, full of, of blaspheme, blaspheme in the name of, of God, full of false gods and, and, and you know, the, these, uh, these, these superheroes that are like gods or whatever, you know, Superman, who's this, this man sent from another planet to save mankind, kind of taking over the role of Jesus Christ or whatever. You know, and, and you have a weak brother who goes, why, why is this pastor going to the movies? Doesn't he know, doesn't he know that, you know, um, it's bad? And then you have other believers that say, well, well, if the pastor's doing it, then I can go and watch the movies and, and entertain myself with the world's entertainment. Isabel, can you close that, that one up there? I think it's still open. Now, be mindful about what you post on Facebook. Be mindful what you put on social media. If you want to go watch that stupid movie, go watch the stupid movie, but don't promote it on Facebook, especially when you're the leader of a church, especially when you're a pastor, you're a mature believer, and there are people that look up to you because their conscience may be defiled. Okay? And I think about other, you're here on the Sunshine Coast, the beaches, and the, and the, and the bikinis, and, and how people, the, the nudity that you just see when you go to the beaches. Hey, if you're going to invite a fellow believer, invite them to some place where you know at least it's probably safe, right? If you invite them to the beach and you know it's full of nudity, you could very well defy, you know, defile the conscience of your fellow believer. They might say, well, why are you bringing me here? Do you think that's acceptable? Do you want my husband to set their, his eyes upon these women? or, you know, want my wife to set their eyes upon these men, you know, think about your fellow believers. Think about their conscience. Think about how you may defile other people. And you may very well defile your own conscience while you're doing that, okay? Be thoughtful. Think of, you know, before I became a, a pastor, before I was sent out and ordained, I went through all my Facebook photos, everything that was, I was tagged in, and any photos that looked kind of questionable, like, for example, there were certain work functions that I was at, and I wasn't drinking alcohol, but there was alcohol on the table because other people were drinking alcohol. You know, I untagged myself from that in case someone sees that photo and goes, well, Kevin has no problem going and, and, and drinking alcohol or something, right? So I removed myself from that, even though I wasn't doing anything wrong, even though, you know, I have the liberty to just sit there and be part of a function and just eat my food, right, and not partake of things that are sinful and wrong, but someone might look at that and go, well, hold on, is this, is this okay for me then to go and, and you know, go and party or whatever and, and drink alcohol? You, you can see how you can defile the conscience of a weaker Christian. So be mindful. If we're going to be charitable, yes, we have knowledge, but if we have charity to go with it, you need to be mindful. How am I going to affect my fellow believers around me? How are my actions going to affect those that do not believe on Jesus Christ? Because if I'm trying to get a Muslim family saved, and I participate of their religious activities, that's to Allah, how in the world am I ever going to be able to convince them that the one true God of the Bible is the one they ought to convert to, the one they ought to believe in, if I've been okay with their religious ceremony and their you know, offering the foods to the idols or whatever. Verse 13, 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Wherefore, now look at this extreme that Paul ends up with. We're, we're, we're near the end now. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend... And this, I know meat sometimes is just food, but this meat is actually meat, like what we call meat, like flesh. Because then he says this, If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That's crazy. That's pretty extreme, right? He says, look, if just eating meat, eating chicken, eating beef offends my brother, then I will not eat meat at all. I'd rather just live on herbs, on salad, on beans or whatever. I'd rather eat that for the rest of my life to not offend my brother. Okay, now, I don't think that's realistic, first of all. You know, obviously, he's exaggerating, but we see the charity in Paul. We see the love in Paul that he has for his fellow believers. That, yes, I have the liberty to eat a good meal, but if that offends my brother, then I will refuse to do that for my brother's sake, not for my sake, but for my brother's sake, because I love them, I have the knowledge, but I have the charity. And you know, we need to be mindful sometimes when we have knowledge and we say, hey, 
I don't care where the chips may fall. I'm just going to give them the unfiltered truth of the Word of God. And if they get offended and leave, then so be it. That's a wrong attitude. Have the charity to go with your knowledge. Now, it's a different thing when you're preaching behind a pulpit. It's a different thing when you're in a church because people that voluntarily are volunteering coming to the church know that they're coming to hear the Word of God preached. They know they're coming to hear the Word of God preached in season and out of season. They know they're coming to learn something. They know they're coming to change something in their life. They know that they may become uncomfortable with what is being preached. They do so because they want to know the Word of God, right? You come to church wanting to hear the Word of God. And let me say to you, if you guys get a chance to preach, then I don't want you to filter the Word of God. I want you to speak the Word of God as it is spoken to the Word of God because we've come here to hear that. But when you're talking to a brother outside of the church who's not necessarily volunteering to be made uncomfortable, you need to keep in mind, hey, that person is, is not, doesn't necessarily want to be chewed out and have their face ripped. They need to be edified. I need to encourage them. and I need to make sure I have the charity to go with it so I don't defile their conscience. And you need to have that in mind. Don't assume the way truth is taught behind a pulpit is the same way you take truth and teach your fellow brother outside of the church. Okay? Keep that in mind. Keep those things in mind. And again, I don't want anyone to think, oh, should I preach this? That might offend anyone. Hey, if it's the truth of the Word of God, I want you to preach it boldly behind the pulpit. Okay? So please, knowledge is great, but charity needs to go together with knowledge to be effective, to build up other believers and not to destroy their conscience, which ultimately is a sin against the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray.